This is our monetary policy exam. Now before I get into all the real stuff of monetary policy, I wanted to review a couple money definitions that were tricky yet important. The first one are the types of money. We had commodity money. Commodity money is a money that is a good that also counts as a currency. We use gold and cigarettes in prison as an example. So like you can use it as an actual good, but then it's also used to trade goods and services for. Representative money is money that has no intrinsic value. So the only value it has is as a currency. So we use Bitcoin as an example. If it wasn't accepted as a currency, it wouldn't be worth anything at all. Fiat money is a type of representative money that has value because the government decrees that it has value. So they, it, it also does not have any intrinsic value. Commodity money is the only one that does. The other thing I want to talk about was the difference between M1 and M2 money. M1 money is already liquid cash. It's your demand deposits, the cash in your pocket, or your debit card. And it already is liquid, so you don't have to go through any process to turn it into cash. M2 money includes M1 money, but also small time assets. So like stocks, bonds, credit cards, things that you can liquidate, but it's not as easy to liquidate as M1 money. So we know Janet Yellen is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and a lot of this with the Federal Reserve is super important to what happens in the economy. And this also goes with the monetary school of economics, all monetary policy. Keynesian is fiscal and classical is no government at all. So before I get into the graphs of monetary policy, let's talk about the tool they use to fight a recession and inflation. So to fight a recession, Janet Yellen and the Federal Reserve is gonna try and increase the money supply. They're gonna try and grow the money supply out of the recession because that will then decrease interest rates. And we'll go into that connection to aggregate demand in a little bit. But first, the ways that they would increase the money supply include buying bonds, also known as open market operations, also known as government, government securities. So buying bonds, buy bonds bigger money, is a good way to think of this, and this is when the Federal Reserve loans the government money. So if the Federal Reserve buys a $10 million bond from the government, they are loaning the government $10 million, and the government can then use that to increase GDP. That's why it increases the money supply. In inflation, they would sell bonds. This is when the Federal Reserve takes the money out of circulation by making the government pay back that loan or sell bonds smaller money. So by selling the bond, they're decreasing the money supply so that interest rates are higher. The reserve requirement is the next tool. This is the amount of money banks have to keep in their vault at all times, so typically around 10%. So if they were to lower this reserve requirement to 8%, banks would not have to keep as much in their vault, they could loan more money out and the money supply would increase. If they raise the reserve requirement, this will mean banks have to keep more money in their vault, less money's out in circulation, and the money supply would decrease. This is not a tool used in operation very much today because it's dangerous to like risk how much banks keep in their vault at a time. The next one is the discount rate. And the last two are both types of interest rates and knowing the difference between the two has been on the AP exam many times and is easy to confuse. The discount rate is the interest rate from the Federal Reserve to commercial banks. This is when the Federal Reserve is being the lender of last resort. They're only supposed to do these in emergencies and it wasn't used very often until the 2008 financial crisis when they bailed banks out. So if they are bailing banks out during a recession, they not only will give them a loan, they will give them a loan with a low discount rate. This way banks are able to loan out more money to their customers because they have the money now, but they don't have to pay back as much in interest to the Fed. If they have a high discount rate, this means the Federal Reserve will still bail out those banks, but those banks have to pay them back with a ton of interest, so it ends up decreasing the money supply because they're using that money to pay back their interest. And the final one is the federal fund rate. So the federal fund rate is the interest rate on loans between commercial banks. So I always remember Fed to bank, discount rate, bank to bank, federal funds rate. Now this is a little bit tricky though when it gets into the grid of it. The federal fund rate looks at the excess reserves being held at the different district banks. And when banks hold their excess reserves there, other commercial banks can come and take out loans from those excess reserves. And the interest rate on those loans is called the federal funds rate. Just like the discount rate, they want it to be low to fight a recession, 
and they want to raise it to fight inflation. So always remember interest rates low to fight a recession, raise interest rates to fight inflation. So those are the tools for monetary policy. Now let's look at the money market graph and how these tools will end up affecting GDP. So the money market graph is on your graph review and on this graph it is important to remember how to label it because I've been noticing that a lot of you guys have been kind of forgetting how to label the different components. So we have a vertical money supply line. This is vertical, vertical because the Federal Reserve has a monopoly over it. They are the only people who can change it and then therefore change the quantity of money. That's the x-axis label. The money demand line is downward sloping to show the inverse relationship between interest rates and the quantity of money. And this is moved by anyone else other than the Federal Reserve because only the Federal Reserve can move this. So the Federal Reserve moves the money supply line, which also means all monetary policy moves the money supply line. So all of those tools I just listed will move this line, buying bonds, lowering the reserve requirement. The money demand line is moved by everyone else. What I mean by this is it's moved by changes in nominal GDP. Nominal because this is the nominal interest rate, the interest rate that banks have to use on loans. So banks use nominal, remember that. So everyone else, so more specifically, anything to do with consumers, producers, the government, or the foreign sector will move money demand. We don't really move money demand as much as we move money supply, but you need to know what moves it just in case they ask a question like, the government decreases taxes, what would happen on the money market graph? Because they're trying to trick you to make you think the government can move money supply, but they can't. They can only move money demand. If that were an example, if the government decreased taxes, this would end up increasing the money demand because nominal GDP would go up. And what we notice is that the quantity of money does not change because they have no power over it. But what does happen is that ends up hurting interest rates, which really helps with the crowding out effect when we get into fiscal policy. So it is a criticism. They are trying to fight a recession and it does end up increasing interest rates. But we'll get into the crowding out effect in the next unit. But remember, only the Fed can move the money supply. So everyone else moves the money demand line. So then, if the Federal Reserve wanted to fight a recession, we already talked about expansionary monetary policy, and the goal of that is to increase the money supply. So here's how this would work. Expansionary monetary policy would increase the money supply, shift the whole money supply curve to the right. This would then decrease nominal interest rates. Let me erase the old ones. Decrease nominal interest rates. Now the whole point of decreasing nominal interest rates is changing one component of GDP, the IG, gross private investment, because when interest rates change, it affects inventory, physical capital, and whether or not we want to buy a house. Remember, IG is from the perspective of the borrowers. We want low interest rates. That's what encourages investment. So if I remember my investment demand graph, if nominal interest rates are lower, this is going to encourage gross private investment. So we will invest more and we show that as a movement down along investment demand. So the lower interest rates will increase the I of GDP. And why this is significant, because that will then affect the aggregate model. So I'm going to draw an aggregate model in a recession. We've already gone over this graph in the reviews. And to show it in a recession, I would start my LRAS to the right of long run equilibrium. And then we're in a recession. If IG goes up, this means that GDP will go up. And if we remember, GDP moves the aggregate demand line. So monetary policy will end up changing aggregate demand and expansionary monetary policy will end up increasing aggregate demand, hopefully back to long run equilibrium, therefore fighting the recession. This will create some inflation, price levels are going up, so real wealth does go down, but it's seen as a necessary evil to increase GDP and decrease the unemployment caused by the recession. So then really quickly, to finish out monetary policy, I'm going to show you contractionary monetary policy on the three graphs so you have a good basis for both policies. 
So again, the money market graph with the quantity of money, nominal interest rates, money supply, and money demand. The investment demand graph with gross private investment, my nominal interest rates, and my downward sloping investment demand line. And my aggregate model with GDP, price level, and now I'm going to say the economy is in an inflation, so I'm going to start the LRAS to the left of long run equilibrium and correctly label all of my components. Okay, so contractionary monetary policy, as I said, is when the Federal Reserve wants to fight inflation by decreasing the money supply. And to repeat, they would do this by selling bonds, raising the reserve requirement, and raising the discount and federal funds rate. All of this would then decrease the money supply. And if the money supply is decreased, nominal interest rates are driven up, which then will relate to gross private investment on the investment demand graph. Nominal interest rates are driven up. We don't want to buy a house. We don't want to invest. So the investment demand graph, investment will decrease and will move up along the line. And then on the aggregate model, if IG is going down, GDP is going down, so the aggregate demand line would shift to the left, hopefully bringing us back to long run equilibrium, which will decrease price levels. This is how they're in fighting inflation. This means real wealth is higher and consumers don't have to pay as much for goods. But it also means that GDP will decrease and it will create some unemployment, which is seen as a necessary evil to fight inflation. So this is the process with contractionary and expansionary monetary policy. In the next unit review, we'll go over the money multiplier rules.